Lord, in Jesus' name, I ask that you be with us tonight and in your name for today. Lord, bless the service, Jesus, bless all the fathers that has come. Lord, in your name, we ask that a special blessing be upon them today. And Lord, as we worship, we ask that you just come in and permeate this place. Lord, we welcome you and we appreciate you. In Jesus' name,
worked hard, have been slaving over stoves, so you can have a special dinner today. Come down and eat. You gotta eat somewhere, and then you can leave. Might as well have food with us and fellowship. Great fun. And uh, let's fathers are getting served by their kids, aren't they? They can be, yes. And let's let's give a great big hand of appreciation to all who is cooked.
as it is from the east and the west. You know, if I had a globe right now, we could stop at the top, we could go, that's the north, and we could go down to the south pole, and we could go from the south pole to the north pole, right? But if we started in the middle, like Illinois, and we went west, eventually we're going to be going east. And there's, there's no, there's no in, uh, end to it. East, west, east, west, east, west. It's quite different than north and the south. And the Lord said he loves us as, as far as the east is from the west. It's an infinite, it's an infinite love. There's no ending to it. There's no stopping to it. Check it on, uh, on a globe when you get home or a map and you'll see what I'm talking about. No ending. Right. That's what the Father, God, has for us. Love unending. And that is what I hope each and every one of the fathers does. I would cause my dad not to love me. I didn't have a perfect father. No, I didn't. My father left when I was nine. He took off. He wanted my mom to quit the church or, or, or him because he wanted somebody who would go drinking and whatever and wear evening gowns and socialize so he could go up in his business. And my mom couldn't do that. So we left her for another woman. I remember him coming to pick us up in his girlfriend's pink Cadillac. <laughs> but you know what? Even though my mom, my dad left my mom, he never forsook us. He told us one day, you know, I divorced your mom, but I did not divorce you. You are my child. And I could call my dad. I could give his advice. He did pay child support. He did send gifts for Christmas and birthdays as long as he could. And he had us in the summer for a few weeks. He did his best. I didn't have a perfect dad. And I don't believe there's a perfect dad sitting here or a perfect dad in the world because they're not God. We all have our flaws. But I'm sure each and every one of you men here love your children as much as you can possibly love them. And you would give your life for them. And that's the type of love God has for us. If it came a choice on us dying or our children, every parent here would give their life. A father nurtures. A father protects. When a father is home, the children feel safe. If an intruder comes in and the father's there, they feel safe because they know their father is their protector and going to protect them. Correct? I knew my mom would, but I always felt safer with my dad because he was big and strong and powerful. <laughs> he had the muscles to back that. And when I got married, that transferred to my husband. I feel safe when my husband's home. If the wind rattles, if something happens, I'll say, Harry! <laughs> and he will go check it out. And that's part of us being a father to our children. They feel safe with us. Yeah. They have a the knowledge that we love them beyond anything. And we need to remember that God is like that too. The Lord is compassionate, gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He's got a long fuse. Moses had written some 500 years earlier, many other Bible writers quoted the verse, first recorded in Exodus 24. While Moses was at the top of Mount Sinai, comparing with God, the people were having a party. These people whom God had just delivered from bondage in Egypt were expressing their gratitude to God by worshiping an idol of the golden calf made from discarded jewelry. On top of that, there was drunkenness and immorality. And the scriptures say that when God saw this, he was angry. God told Moses to step back. He said, and this is in the living Bible paraphrase, so I kept it because it's I think it's pretty cool. Mo, I'm going to root these party animals. I'll start a new nation with, with, that, with you. How about it? But Moses fell on his face and he killed the God's grace. But I will no longer go with you, Moses. You're 
on your own. But once again, Moses pleads, and God agrees, and he even promises to give Moses a new copy of the Ten Commandments. Because when Moses came down and saw what the people were doing, he was angry, and he slammed the tablets down and broke them. He had righteous anger, and it was justified, but God didn't like his actions. We have to be able to have righteous anger, but still show compassion, compassion, mercy, and forgiveness. And sometimes our children bring us to that righteous nation, and we just want to throttle them. But God, in His mercy and grace, doesn't throttle us, and we need to be patient and kind and considerate with our children and understand their age. We are their teachers, parents. Father, you are their teacher. Yeah. And they're going to look to you on how you handle your anger, how you forgive, your actions, what you do when they mess up royally. And that is going to be a picture of them for God because <coughs> God is called the Father. And if they don't have a good father growing up, they're not going to be able to look at God as a good father. You play that pivotal role. So how you handle your anger, how you talk to your children, how you discipline them, how you forget them, that is an indelible mark on their brain. And I'm not saying... We as parents don't lose our tempers because we do. Uh -huh. And we have to get down and say, God, forgive me. But I remember my mother and my dad, actually. If I was at the table and I spilled milk or I did something, I was sure I was in trouble and they'd say, that's okay. I mean, it's an accident. And we don't get angry at accidents. Now, if my father told me to push my glass back, and quit fidgeting, and I didn't do it, and I knocked it over. Well, he was angry, and he said, I told you to push that glass back. Now you clean it up. There was a difference. If I did it quite by accident, he cleaned it up. If I did it because I wasn't listening, he still forgave me. He did that a little bit of anger, and he made me clean it up. And that was a lesson learned. But I will always remember their compassion and their kindness and their forgiveness. My mom and dad show us this. And I remember many a times my mom pleading for mercy with my dad <laughs> for something we did. Huh? And we have that same opportunity. We can plead with the Father for something we did or somebody else did, and He will listen. And we can turn His heart and we can turn His mind. We can. Moses is a good example, and so is Elijah. God gets angry. He puts up with a great deal before reaching his boiling point. Over and over again, the Bible tells us the reason. God exercises such great patience is that he's hoping we'll take advantage of the extension of his grace to turn from our sin, seek his forgiveness, and begin to obey him. Yet most of us make the mistaken assumption that God's patience really means that he isn't that concerned about our disobedience. And so we abuse his patience. But thank God he's got a long fuse. Yeah. And children, you can abuse your father's patience as well by not listening and keep doing what you're doing over and over and over again, even though he's instructing. Do not expect if you're doing something over and over and over again and he's asked you not to do it, don't expect him not to get angry because he's going to get angry. And then don't be mad at him because he got angry at you. When he's angry, he's still going to show patience, he's still going to show kindness, and he's still going to be forgiving. But there may be a punishment in store if you keep testing his patience. 
And that's our God as well. If we keep testing his patience over and over and over and over again, asking his forgiveness over and over and over again for something we know we shouldn't do, we get up and do it, well, we may be facing his wrath. Psalms 133 tells us that if God kept a detailed record of our sins, none of us would be able to stand before him. In Isaiah 57, 16, God says, If I keep kept going up in your face your past failures, if I chose to retain an angry disposition toward you because of your sin, your spirit within you would grow faint before me, and you would wither up and die. And that is a good example for us parents as well. If we're constantly throwing past failures in the face of our kids, Every time they do something, we throw something they did two weeks ago or a month ago. Eventually, they're going to just turn you off. Their spirit within them is going to grow faint, and they could glitter up and die. Let the past be the past. If I can give you any advice at all, the past is the past. Do not bring it up continually. Deal with the present. You've already dealt with the past. And forgive your child so that they can live and count it a blessing that you are their parent. Thank goodness, I often saw God's forgiveness. And he doesn't keep on accusing. He doesn't keep on harboring his anger towards me. He chooses to have a short memory where previously forgiven sins are concerned. Verse 10 says he does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. If God punished us every time we deserved it, we would be in a perpetual state of receiving retribution. Every time we turn around, God would be chastising us for our selfish attitude, hurtful words, prideful spirit, materialism, indifference to the need of others, etc., etc. The Bible word for the sixth skin of God is called forbearance. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. And just as we are not perfect, we can't expect our children or others to be perfect. We have to understand. And here's a funny story. Family went out for ice cream. Everyone ordered their favorite flavor. The seven-year-old son wanted bubble gum. Everyone said, no, no, no. But he cried and he was so upset that the father finally said, okay. He bought him the bubble gum ice cream anyway. When they were all done, the seven-year-old son still had ice cream. And they said, throw it away. And he cried again, no, please, please. So the father said, Soft-hearted, okay, you can bring it. But it was against his own better judgment. Better judgment. So the kid started pulling at the bug out of his mouth. Before long, he was attached to his sister. She started screaming. He pulled over to the shoulders. Before the drive was over, the kid's hands was perfectly stuck together. As they left the car, everyone looked back and saw pieces of bubble gum on the car pole street. The <laughs> father <laughs> thought to himself, I could discipline him. He certainly deserves it. We said no, but he was so demanding, I said yes. So in this case, I'm going to forget it. Love is going to cover a multitude of sins. And a lot of cleanup in the car for all the stuff on bubble gum. A lot of ice. And sometimes we do go that way. We plead and beg, please, 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 please. And God knows that we're going to be in trouble. He finally says, okay, go and do what you want to do. And then we fall down, and then we're crying, oh, God, please forgive us. And God says, okay, we're going to have forbearance for you. We're going to forgive you. We're going to lift you back up. He, we don't get what we deserve. And thankfully, God's got a long, huge, short memory and a thick skin. He's our 
example then of a father. And every single one of you are doing an awesome job. I want to commend you on the job that you are doing. This isn't so much as telling you what you need to do, but letting people understand the Father's heart. Verses 11 and 12 say, For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our, our transgressions from us. If you've ever wondered how serious God is about taking care of your sin, he has all sets of all sorts of metaphors in scripture, like this one to describe what he desires to do with your sin. Micah 719. He will turn again, he will have compassion upon us, he will subdue our iniquities, and that will cast all our sins into the depths of the sea. Isaiah 38, 17. Behold, for peace I have great bitterness, but thou hast in love to my soul delivered it from the pit of corruption, for thou hast cast all my sins behind my back. So he's going to trample them underfoot and throw them into the deepest part of the sea. He's going to put them behind his back so we can't see it. Isaiah 43, 25 says, I, even I, am he that blotted out thy transgressions by their own sake, and we will we not remember your sins. He's not going to remember our sins, but he's going to blot them out. Isaiah 44, 22 says, I have blotted out as a thick cloud thy transgression, and as a cloud thy sins return unto me, for I have redeemed thee. He's blotting out our sins. He's blotting them out. Jeremiah 31, 34 says, And they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother's name, but the Lord. For they shall all know me, from the least of them unto the greatest of them, saith the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. To me, that is miraculous. To know that the God who created everything is going to forgive my sins, cast them out into a sea, blot them out, never remember them against me. His love and forgiveness and mercy cannot be measured. He wants us to repent of our sins. Get the Holy Ghost, be baptized in Jesus' name, and live an overcoming life. And he gives us the Holy Ghost to help us live an overcoming life. He doesn't even leave us comfortless. He doesn't leave us without help. But he gives us all the help we need. What more can we ask of Jesus Christ? What more can we ask of the God of eternity who created everything we see? He's adopted us as sons and daughters. We can take full advantage of his forgiveness. If you've experienced it, it's, it's possible as a child of God that you're not basking in his grace today. You're not taking full advantage of his forgiveness. You've forgotten that his God has a long view, short memory, and big skin, and a big heart. You may never have had an earthly father who is characterized by these traits, but your heavenly father wants you to be secure in his love. He gives us fathers, and he gives us father figures who we can look up to if we don't have a natural father. He will give us a father to look to, just as I said on Mother's Day. He will give you a mother to look to, so you can understand the process of the church. And he gives you a father to look to so you can understand the love of a father that he has for you. He 
loves you with a great love. He's not like earthly fathers. Sometimes our earthly father disappoints us. Sometimes our earthly father leaves us. Sometimes our earthly father is cruel and mean. But our heavenly father is not. And if we follow his example and we let him love us the way he wants. Now, we have a heavenly father for an example as well. A little boy was sitting in Sunday school class listening to his teacher describe how in the beginning of creation God made mankind from the dust of the earth. And how after death our bodies will decompose and return to dust. The little boy turned to his friend and said, You know, I think I've got somebody under my bed. I'm not sure whether he's coming or going. <laughs> Funny story. Yes, we return to dust, but usually we're in a casket, nobody sees our dust. <laughs> but we have plenty of dust in our houses. We're not invincible as we sometimes think we are. The good news is that we have a compassionate Father. God understands our tenuous nature. He factors in our fertility, our, how, how frail we are. When he weighs his responsibilities. That a family cannot be without you. They need your strength, your support, your love, your compassion. They need your training, especially a boy but girls do as well. Because you know something, fathers? Girls will relate to their husbands the way they relate to you. Their first love and their first learning of devotion and how a man cares for you and how a man loves you comes from you. And if they don't have that, it's going to be hard for them to be a wife, quite frankly. Just as girls need their mothers for this, they also need their fathers to show them this as well. God ordained that there be a father and a mother in the home. That was his award. That, that's how he ordained it. And if we don't have a father or mother, when, when, when I got divorced, I got down and I prayed and I said, Lord, be the father to my children that they're going to need. Show me when they're sneaking. Show me when they're being bad. Help me, Lord, to know when to pray for them and give me the wisdom to instruct them and help them to become healthy so they can be good wives and mothers and can go out of the community and make a living and do what they need to and have a family. And God did that for me. And he will do that for you. If you are a mother without a husband, you can pray the same prayer. My mom prayed it for me. And so I learned from that. I prayed it for my kids. Believe me, I never could get by with anything. I'd come home and my mother would say, You did, play, play, play. No, I didn't. Uh huh. Yeah, the Lord showed me. Or I found this in the car. Or somebody called me and told me, saw where you were. Yeah, every single time. I don't care if I was out of state in California. My mom knew what I did wrong when I got back to Maine. Why? Because God took her at her word. Thank you, Jesus. God took the prayer, and he became my father. There are times when it's appropriate to demand something of our kids. As good dads, we know our kids' limitations. We can take into account our children's age, temperament, peer pressure, physical health, school struggles, popularity issues. Our Heavenly Father is not any less sensitive than an earthly dad who weighs these factors when dealing with a child. No child can be treated the same. 
I don't care how many children you have in the home. They're all going to have their own personalities. They're all going to have their own faults. They're all going to have their own failures. And it's up to us to love them the way they need to be loved. We don't show more love to one than the other. God thankfully does not do that with us. But we do take into account these things and work with them accordingly. I could not punish Kristen the way I punished Sharon and vice versa. They were two totally different. I mean, they were like night and day. And I had to learn. I had to learn how to deal with each one of them and their personalities and not destroy them. Because if you are too strict, too demanding, too whatever, you can destroy your child's self-confidence. You can destroy them. You can. You are the one that can destroy them the most. They can deal with bullies at school. But if they come home and they're bullied as well, home should be a place of safety and comfort and joy. And I know each and every one of your homes are. Please understand that I do appreciate all of you fathers, and you are doing an awesome job, and it shows with the children. And I'm getting ready to close. In 1992, the Olympics in Barcelona, Spain, the world watched as a parable of Father's love is played out on international television. As the gun sounded for the 400 race, Great Britain's Derek Redman knew that his lifelong dream of winning the gold was in view. He was ahead of everybody by a long shot. But as he entered the backstretch, Redman was sent sprawling by the ripping pain of a torn hamstring. And by an act of sheer will, he struggled to his feet in excruciating pain and began hopping toward the finish line. Suddenly, Derek's father bounded out of the sands past the security guard. He threw his arms around his son, and an old voice choked with emotion. He whispered, Come on, son, let's finish this together. And the crowd cheered and wept as they watched the father, his wounded son, jerkily. Helping him down, jerking him down the stretch and across the finish line. That was a father's love. This boy, his dream was shattered by no fault of his own, but his body gave out. His hamstring broke and he fell to the ground and he was not able to get up and finish. But as he hobbled, the father ran past the security guards and onto the field. And I'm going to tell you, if you are hobbling today because you're in pain, if you're hobbling today because something is wrong, there is a God who will push past the security guards. There is a God who will run out onto the, on the, onto the grounds and will help you hobble to the finish line. That is a father, a father's love. That's a father's love. He doesn't want you to be afraid of him. Those who keep his covenant and remember to obey his precepts, to fear God is to know and obey God's word. But that word fear means respect. Your children need to respect you. So if you go fits and you scream and holler and you stomp around and you act like a child when things don't go your way, you're going to lose respect of your children. And they need to respect you to look up to you to understand how to respect God as well. Fathers, I ask you today, I ask you today to have a long fuse, a short memory, thick skin, and a big heart. Raise your children to know God and to respect God. And to respect God, they also have to respect the pastor. 
because sometimes we have to make rules that's good for you about sin. And if they cannot respect the pastor, they will not respect God. And if they cannot respect you, and you're a Christian, they will also not respect God. You have a big responsibility on how to treat your children. Us wives and mothers, we do too. But I'm talking to you as a father today because it's Father's Day. I'm not putting all of this on you because it's a family. And mother and father work together to foster this. If you don't know what to do, you have a heavenly father who's going to direct you. Get down and say, God, you see what my child did? Now help me. Give me the wisdom to know how to direct them. Give me the wisdom to instruct them. And God will give you the wisdom. But let's raise our children in the fear and respect of our elders and ourselves. If they can't respect authority, they will never hold a job. If they can't respect authority, they'll never be able to go to school and graduate. We have a lot of children out there who don't respect. And they're not going to make anything of their lives. When I was a child, we didn't have that. Boy, we respected those elders. And we respected those that had the rule over us. We respected them. They demanded respect and we respect it. Today, not so much. Learn to seek the Lord for all of your answers. In your family, in your home, in your own life. And he will not steer you wrong. We're going to have trials. We're going to have tribulations, and we are going to fall down and skin our knee, and we are going to do things wrong. We are going to do things right every time. As a father, as a Christian, as a person out in the community, we're going to fall. But thank goodness we have a father who loves us and who is going to be there for us. John 14, 21 says, Whoever has my, my commands and obeys them, he is the one who loves me. He who loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and will come and show myself to him. Fearing God is the path to experience in his presence and love in our life. He wants us to know his love for frail seedlings. He wants you to know his love for fearing sons and daughters. He wants us to love and be loved. And I took this message, made it my own, but I took it from the internet from John Nickelden, who is a senior pastor in Illinois. Because it touched me, and I felt it was appropriate for today. I sometimes have a hard time speaking to fathers because my father was not in the room. So I have a hard time sometimes relating to men. Sorry, but I do. Relating to my husband. Relating to fathers. And if my past messages have been hard, I'm sorry. I tried today to get something that can show you a father's love. Unconditional. I never had that growing up, but I do have a father who loves me unconditionally. And I have learned much from him. And I have learned much from watching you. And when I say I appreciate the job you're doing, I truly mean it. All you can ask for is your children to love you the way you love them unconditionally. And they will understand your failures, especially don't be afraid to say I'm sorry. If you make a bad choice, if you do something wrong, don't be afraid to go to them and put them on your knees and say I am 
so sorry. I didn't do quite the what I should have done in this situation, and I'm sorry. And that is going to show them also God's love. That you're man enough to say I'm sorry. They will never forget that. And then in turn you go to God and say, God, I am sorry. You understand how it works? Why don't we stand? I hope you learned something today about the Father's love and how God loves you. Because He loves you more than anything. And if you want to come down and you want to pray, come pray. Seek His face. If you have a need, come and pray. If you want to just bask in His presence and His love, come and pray. Because as you pray and you reach out to Him, 